So what's your favorite conspiracy theory? Area 51? Aliens? Maybe the flat earth theory? Chad? I'd come across a couple kind of strange ones recently. So apparently there's a conspiracy theory revolving that Finland doesn't exist, the country. The idea is back in 1918, Russia and Japan, they created the fictional country of Finland and have deceived the rest of the world in order for, I suppose, to be able to fish in that region. I think that's the theory. Another kind of weird one came across recently. Meghan Markle and Prince Harry are robots. I don't know if you knew this. I guess there was a episode of Britain's Got Talent where the Duke and the Duchess of Sussex, they were in the audience, supposedly, and when the camera panned past them applauding, they weren't blinking. So they're robots is the logical conclusion, right? Um, so some of these theories conspiracy theories. They're kind of funny on some level. On another level, they can be really serious. And some of them, just a few people kind of buy into. But other ones, there's enormous amounts of people that are invested into these theories. So, for example, there was some studies that were being done recently on the conspiracy theory of moon landings, on, on whether or not we've landed on the moon. And one study, one recent poll in Great Britain found 21% of 24 through 35-year-olds, 21% of 24 through 35-year-olds agreed with the statement that the moon landings were staged. That's amazing to think about, isn't it? So how do you prove to someone who believes that we didn't land on the moon, how would you go about proving to them that we did, in fact, do that? Take lots of photographs? Well, that obviously doesn't work because you can doctor up the photographs. How about if we bring something back from the moon? Well, we've done that. We've got lots of moon rocks that have been brought back and that doesn't seem to do the trick either. In fact, we've even taken things from here and left them on the moon and that seems to not do it. So how would you go about to kind of definitively prove to a skeptic that we have, in fact, landed on the moon. Maybe what you'd say is we would take that person, we would put him in a rocket, we would fly him to the moon, and we would let them walk on the moon's surface. That has to do it, right? There's no way around that. Except, a person might say, well, the moment I step into that rocket, what I'm really doing is stepping into a state-of-the-art virtual reality simulator, and then they're maybe going to pipe in some drugs of some sort into the air and start hallucinating, you name it. The, the reality of the situation is there's no possible way, if someone wants to, there's no possible way to disprove a belief. There's no mountain of evidence that you can come up with. Well, where did this all come from? Well, it's a, historians look back, especially at the 1970s in the West with Watergate and events like that, where there began to be this kind of penchant of doubting governments and media and authorities doing cover-ups and things like that. Today, though, we're in what's called a post-truth culture. I don't know if you heard that term, but in 2016, that was the word of the year for Webster Dictionary. Um, we're in a post-truth culture. And the idea is we're in this culture where We've been told this media outlet or that media outlet, right? They're biased or they're, they're sharing fake news and anyone can say anything on Twitter on, and Instagram and on social media and millions of people will be listening to it and it just becomes impossible to sift through all this information. So for those who want there to be a conspiracy, they've got everything they need. There's plenty of places to find justification. Why, though? Why want to believe in these things? Well, people who believe in conspiracy theories, they can't be reasoned with because the reason is the problem. There's no reason you could give that isn't suspect. There's some type of psychological opposition. The conspiracy needs to exist on some level. Well, 2,000 years ago, 
In fact, for 2,000 years, people have gone to ridiculous lengths to try to prove that the resurrection didn't happen. In fact, 2,000 years ago, right in the pages of our Gospels, we have the first conspiracies right there being set up. Jewish leaders paying off guards to try to spread rumors that the disciples had stolen the body of Jesus. But when Jesus was physically appearing to so many people, just a day or two later, those rumors just didn't stand a chance. And today, we are living in this incredibly interesting time in history where we can say that virtually all historians, all historians of that ancient time period when Jesus lived and died, anyone that's a professional historian of that time period, virtually all of them, regardless of religion or philosophy, they all agree on a certain state of what you've heard me teach before called minimal facts. They all agree that first, there was this Jesus that died under crucifixion, under Pontius Pilate, Second, that three days later, tons of people were claiming to be having seen this risen Jesus, having these experiences. Third, enemies of Jesus, like Paul, were claiming to be having these experiences. Fourth, that skeptics, ones that had no dog in the fight whatsoever, like James, had experiences of the risen Jesus. And fifth, probably the most interesting at all these eyewitnesses, they went to their deaths, still claiming that Jesus had risen from the dead. That one's huge. In fact, Paul wrote 1 Corinthians, the text that our New Testament reading is from. He, he wrote that text, that letter to that church in 57 A.D., Okay, 57 AD, that's roughly about 25 years after the crucifixion of Jesus. And in the section right before what we read for today, this is what Paul writes. He says, what I received, I passed on to you. What I received, past tense, I passed on to you, past tense. So what he's receiving, or what he's telling this congregation, he's already received it, he's already taught them, it predates 57 AD by quite a bit of time. So what he's about to say, he's reminding them of what historians, both Christian and non-Christian historians, recognize as an early creed, a summary statement of what's been believed. And how early was this creed being recited? This creed, historians say, regardless of again, of whether they're Christian or non-Christian, and this, if they study this time period, that it's within a few years of Jesus' crucifixion. In fact, there's a historian, Gerd Ludemann, an extremely important, famous New Testament historian. He's not a Christian. He's a skeptic. And he writes this. He says that the creed is, quote, to be dated to the first two years after the crucifixion of Jesus, not later than three years. So this creed has been passed around. By the time Paul's writing this letter, it's been passed around for over 20 years. It was written, it was composed, put together within just a couple years of the crucifixion. You want to hear the creed? What I received I passed on to you as of first importance, Paul writes, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried that he was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures, and then he appeared to Cephas, and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. So we know that there were lots of eyewitnesses. Just think of those disciples, all willing to die for this confession, all willing to die for this creed, that Christ rose. Lots of people died trusting the testimony of other people, right? The apostles' death is significant because they're not dying for the testimony of other people. They're dying because they claimed they were there, that they saw Jesus, that they touched him, that they experienced the risen Jesus. And to a man, they never budged to their deaths. 
And so people go to ridiculous lengths to try to explain this away. The swoon theory, Jesus passed out on the cross, woke up later. Uh, the group hallucination uh, theory, that, uh, that there was a group hallucination of, of, that took place with those disciples. When the only explanation that can account for all of our minimal facts, all five of them, the only one that can account for them is that Jesus did, in fact, rise. There was a resurrection. Why then do people, if that's the best explanation, why then do people come up with conspiracies? Why do they doubt? Because people don't like the alternative. If he rose, there's a God. Our lives aren't our own, and there's a coming judgment. In our sins, we need Jesus to stay dead. There is a God, and our lives aren't our own, and there is a coming judgment, but we don't need to fear God or to fear this coming judgment. That's why the resurrection matters. Because if Christ is alive, if Christ lives, then Christ reigns. This is the most important fact in all the world. If Christ lives, Christ reigns. If Christ is risen, Christ reigns. If he's risen, you are safe, you're forgiven. It's good that your life is not your own because you are now part of a new family, a new identity, a new kingdom, a new humanity in Christ. So think about who these people are that Paul's writing to, the Corinthians. If you've ever read 1 Corinthians, it's a wild letter. The Corinthians, they knew that they were a screwed up bunch of people. They were supposed to be this new, brand new Christian church. They were supposed to be champions of the poor. But instead, there was classism and, and neglect for the poor taking place in spades. They were supposed to be creating a, a new community of love and harmony. And instead, they were suing each other. And there were divisions. They were supposed to be examples of joy-filled virtue, but instead they were reckless, and there's incest and drunkenness and more and more. In a word, these people were dangerous. They had enormous potential for chaos and mayhem. And after a whole letter of Paul addressing all these issues one after the other, they must have been saying to themselves, man, I'm starting to wish that there isn't a God. Because what does he think of us? How can we be his representatives? How can we share the gospel? How can we have any hope ourselves after the types of lives that we've been living in his name? And so Paul ends this letter with the resurrection. He ends this letter with why the resurrection matters. If Christ is risen, then Christ reigns. And there's two parts to the discussion. There always is. Did it happen? Did he actually rise from the dead? And we can tend to focus on that to the exclusion of the other. What does it mean if he's risen from the dead? We need both of these things together. And as Christians, we need to be able to explain both of these things together. Did he rise from the dead? Can you talk about that and the historicity of it? But can you also explain clearly why he rose from the dead? And what it means that he rose from the dead. Paul started with, did it happen? He explained all the witnesses, the beyond a reasonable doubt case for the resurrection. And now he moves on to what does this mean? And he says this, but Christ has indeed been raised from the dead. The first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. The first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Do you know what first fruits are? So for about a thousand years, the Jewish people and the nation of Israel, every year at harvest time, the Israelites would bring the first kind of batch of their harvests, and they would bring it to the temple, and they would offer it uh, to God as a sacrifice. Their first reaping of their crops, their first batch from their flocks, they would bring them. And by giving this first reaping to God, they were saying, the whole thing belongs to you, God. My bringing this first bit is my sign that I know that everything actually belongs to you. 
It was a pledge by the people that there was more to come, more giving to come. Jesus rising from the dead is a first fruit. It is a pledge. But it is not a pledge from us to God. It is a pledge from God to us. It's a sign that there is more to come. If Jesus is indeed alive, then that means Jesus is exactly who he claimed to be, the Son of God come to die for sins. The one life raised is a sign that there is more to come for you and me, that God can and will raise us someday. Like the first flowers that you see in spring, right? Maybe you're starting to think a little bit about that already. And the joyful anticipation of that field of flowers, right? Those first flowers tells you there's going to be a whole lot more coming and some warm sunshine. It's on the way. Jesus is the first, and he's the sign that there's more raising to come. But what exactly is to come? What do we mean by this resurrection, this new life to come? Paul says, for since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. Paul reminds these Corinthians why they screw up so much. And why death is inevitable for them. They are children of the ancestor Adam, that head, that first of humanity, and a humanity that so often, like the Corinthians, screwed up, neglectful towards those in need, divisive, uncontrollable, reckless. In a word, we are dangerous. We are a dangerous species with an enormous potential for chaos and mayhem. And when Adam started doing these things, he brought death into the world, and so we all inherit the same chaotic and mayhem-making existence, one destined to end just like our fathers, Adam's life ended, destined for death. If Adam died, you can be certain that you, his ancestor, will die too. But Jesus did something absolutely amazing. On that cross, he brought you into a new family, a new humanity. Through his death, all your sins have been forgiven by God. He sees you as holy. He sees you as precious, infinitely valuable to him. Because you have now literally become Jesus' own kin. You are in the new family, the new family of Jesus. And so you now have a new inheritance. Not a chaotic and mayhem-making existence, but one of forgiveness and renewal, of being remade. And this new existence, it is not destined for death, but for life. And we are certain of this. Because if Jesus is risen, then Jesus reigns. You can be certain that you, his kin, will be with him. He is in control through Jesus' death. And through the faith in your hearts that you hold on to this promise, it is inevitable. Why? Because if Jesus is risen, Jesus reigns. That's what the resurrection is about at the end of the day. Two things. Did it happen? Did he rise? Yes, he did. Not metaphorically, not spiritually, not analogously, but physically, he came back to life. The testimony has been preserved. The testimony is overwhelming. But what does this mean? What does this mean for me, for you? If Jesus rose from the dead, you are next. That is why the resurrection matters. If Christ is risen, Christ reigns. And if he's reigning, then think of what that means for your life. That means everyone else that claims to be reigning, or that pretends to be reigning, or that your mind tells you is reigning, is not reigning. The governments of this world, COVID-19, the oppressive forces of this world, the devil, your sins, none of these things are reigning. Christ reigns. There is nothing to fear, because if Christ is risen, Christ reigns. Amen.
Please stand. Knowing that Christ reigns, may the peace of God that transcends all understanding, may it dwell richly in your hearts and in your minds through faith in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.